I think that the majority of the uh, people would agree that that is best to try to salvage because you can always uh, remove later but once it's removed it's it's a it's a choice that you can't come back from and so if in when in doubt they they usually try to preserve stabilize preserve and then make the decision later on and it's hard to know what to do because there's not an algorithm at, at one time in the um, 80s and 90s uh, people one of the things that would in the thought process was if, if the person did not have, uh, we'll take for the lower limb, if they didn't have feeling on the bottom of their foot, that was an indication that you should amputate. And then a large study called the LEAP study, the Lower Extremity Amput um, um, Assessment Project, uh, it was out at Hopkins um, in the early 90s. What they showed, it finally had 600 patients enrolled, approximately 600 patients enrolled. And looking at this low, large cohort, they were able to say, well, wait a second, Few people did not get an amputation when they had the nerve injury or the, did not have the sensation. Approximately 80% of those, the nerve sensation returned later on. So, you know, think about all the people in the prior decades that had the limb removed. From the military side, whenever we had that large increase of funding and I spoke about, what we did was we um, initiated a call for a clinical trials consortium and, and we have a, a consortium called the, the Major Extremity Trauma Research Consortium. It's out of Hopkins, the same group that did the LEAP study applied and, and, and won the award. And what we're doing is we have, up to, um, I believe there's 22 core centers and then the four big medical treatment centers for the military that are part of it and they have another 30 or 40 satellite centers and they're, they're going probably around 12, 15 prospective studies that are looking at these limb salvage amputation questions. If you're waiting for somebody to do something, that somebody has to be you. And so we initiated that and uh, through, through this collaboration and this consortium, I think a lot of these questions on whether or not things should be amputated early on, what's the best treatments, uh, and then what's the actual ultimate outcome of these, those injuries are, is going to show up. It's the elite medical centers because that's who gets the patients. You know, the, place, the places that are the, the smaller centers might only have several hundred trauma patients where a very large one might have up to 7,000 per year. So it, it makes economic sense to focus our efforts there. The way it's going to change the practice is it should give them um, improved guidelines, first off, on how to tr treat patients. For example, um, in the limb salvage, in these open fractures, which, which, which has the missing muscle, the skin, and the bone, and the injuries exposed. And it's highly contaminated, and also is, um, the, they struggle with infection. You know, it's up to 30% infection rate of these. Non-union, uh, according to the LEAP study, uh, approximately 30% non-union. And then even when they do abate infection and get union, there's a poor outcome because it's not a functional limb. In the civilian world, they use a lot of the, what they call an IM nail, intramedullary nail that actually goes down the canal uh, of the bone, and it provides fixation and it's sturdy and it works. The issue is, is that you're introducing hardware into this contaminated wound, and this um, hardware is basically uh, a nidus for infection. What it does is it creates a foreign body effect and, and promotes infection and can promote infection. The, in the military, during throughout the war, what they did is use these ring fixators, which are percutaneous pins that go in to the, the um, bone, both proximal and distal to the wound. And then they have these rings that they come onto. So no hardware is actually in the, the bone defect into the wound site. Now these anecdotally have shown great uh, outcomes. The issue is the patient has to wear this big ring fixator around for a year, sometimes 18 months or longer. So there's lots of morbidity, patients don't like it. And the other thing is the cost is about 20 times more expensive than the nail. Now, one could say if, if you abate infection, you know, just a few percentage infection increase, it would be worth it fiscally because 
you don't have to go back in and, and reoperate, which is you know roughly fifty thousand dollars for that every time an infection comes up. Uh, some modeling has shown roughly fifty seventy five thousand dollars to bring the patient back in, wash out, and regraft and keep them in the, the hospital. So it, it pays for itself if it, if it's actually, but we don't know. So one of the large first studies that we're doing is a large prospective randomized trial where you know the patient consents and either goes into the IM nail or the ring fixator. And so what we'll be able to do is give these people guidelines on whether or not this newer uh, therapy uh, both uh, improves outcomes and then we also will be able to on the outside see if it's worthwhile. Part of this is driving um, for us in the military if we know that this will improve the outcomes it's done. But on the civilian sector if the insurance does not reimburse it, the clinician does not always uh, allow to do it because it doesn't make sense. And so we'd actually have an economist, chief economist, that will allow uh, us to look at uh, whether or not you know, the, 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 the treatment, the cost of the treatment, the outcomes, the complications, and how much those complications cost and see actually if it makes sense.